Hello and welcome. Very good to be with you and have your company. Now, my first guest in this brand new series is the Chinese dissident artist and now author Ai Weiwei. Starting off as a filmmaker in the late 70s, he's now famed for his provocative and political work. Perhaps best known for his art installations, from the 14,000 life jackets used by refugees he attached to a Berlin concert hall, to filling a gallery in London with 100 million handcrafted sunflower seeds to question the made in China phenomenon. He has also disowned one of his most famous designs, the Bird's Nest Stadium that was at the heart of the 2008 Beijing Olympics, citing serious concerns over the Chinese government's human rights record. Following the destruction of his studio and imprisonment in China, he left his home country, but continues to document, create and agitate. He joins me now from his latest abode in Portugal. Sadly, COVID travel restrictions means we cannot be together in person. But Ai Weiwei, welcome. Thank you. Uh, your latest creation is your book, your memoir, A Thousand Years of Joys and Sorrows. What have you learned about yourself from writing it? Well, I think uh, the purpose to writing this book is to find out my relations with my father. And uh, I realized during the detention, I realized, um, you know, most of our memories either being erased or destroyed by the authority. So I think the, the most dangerous thing the authority is doing to to authoritarian state is to trying to change the facts, what happened in the past. So I have to establish a real understanding of my father's condition and, uh, in almost past 100 years, and uh, to write down what I know and uh, to leave this to my son. Yes, that's the big driving force, your, your son, who you say will be your ultimate arbiter. Uh, you, I talked about you being imprisoned, uh, being under arrest for charges of a, of a tax bill of millions. This was after your artistic activities and speaking out against the Chinese government online. But when you talk about your father, he was internally exiled. You were with him. You were separate from your mother. Uh, he was exiled for being a poet and a so-called intellectual. And you lived in a hole in the ground together. And I, I wonder for you how much that prepared you for your own imprisonment. Well, my father was exiled in Xinjiang province, where the Uyghur people today have the re-education camps. So we are probably the first group moved to there to be re-educated. And uh, my father spent about 20 years in that region and uh, forbidden to write uh, anything. So he's been doing hard labor and also we're being punished to live underground in a hole. So all those experiences, uh, I later, much later, uh, realized that uh, made me become uh, me today. Um, I would look at uh, society or political system with a different angle and a very different perspective. And in terms of your situation now, you're talking to me from Portugal, are you able to go back to China? I don't think uh, I can be safely stay in China. Maybe they would allow me to to get into China because I'm a Chinese uh, citizen. But uh, I wouldn't know I would be safe in there and also I would not know if they would let me out. I talk to my mom uh, almost daily and the last sentence she always tell me, do not come back. She knows I may want to go back. So your mother's still there, but you can't go yes. back. What, what do you think would happen to you? Um, who knows? It's never, you never can pre uh, predict, you know. I know so many people disappeared. I know many people being sentenced heavily for didn't do anything wrong. You just don't know. I mean, I suppose that's the thing. When you, I, I went to the exhibition that you held uh, at the Royal Academy in London, uh, in which you recreated 
some of those scenes of your own imprisonment, the 81 days. Uh, people may remember you also kind of crowdfunded to pay the millions that you were said to owe in tax. Some people were just throwing the money in uh, to your garden, I, I understand, uh, with paper aeroplanes. But actually, I, I understand you formed a bond with the guards. They had to follow you everywhere to go to the toilet, to the shower. That came across in the art that you created about it. And those guards started to ask you for adv advice, is that right? About their own lives, their love lives? Yes, they also, um, they are soldiers, but uh, they're only very young, you know, 20 years old, and they know nothing about outside the world. The only thing they do is trying to protect someone like me. They don't even know the name. So they will have a lot of curiosity about outside, about everything uh, in life. I think they, they are also just like me as a prisoners. As youngsters, they, they really like to know more about sex or, or any experience like that. You know, it's, uh, I don't have a rich experience, but I still can tell them more. <laughs> Good, we've got that out at this point. But I was going to say, of course, some of your formative years in that time, uh, you, you went to New York and had a, your own education, I'm sure. But I was going to come to that. The guards that were tasked with making sure you were where you were meant to be, you say they didn't know who you were. Do people in China know who Ai Weiwei is? Before 2008, when I started to design this uh, uh, stadium, and uh, more people know me because I was an architect. And uh, later, when I start to in questioning the state's uh, corruption and all those kind of mishandling of a school's uh, building, and uh, which cost uh, over 5,000 students uh, uh, lost their life. And uh, I've been totally shut off from the internet and uh, also on the media. So. I guess not, not so many people know me. I think that's fascinating that you could be so famous outside of your country and yet inside your country you've been removed or erased or disappeared, uh, not, not physically of course, but just from the, the record. Because how much do you think people in China know that they don't know things? Well, China and the, the world outside China is two different world. It's two parallel world. They hold very different understanding about humanity, about uh, freedom of speech, about uh, political ideologies. So they openly uh, ignore or or criticize what is happening in the West. So is China have a 1.4 billion people, and uh, they formally. Uh, believes in communist uh, propaganda. And that propaganda is uh, very successful. And also they have a very strong censorship. So they would make sure voice like me would never be heard. And then I suppose that's, you've got to question how successful your activism is then. You know, if, it, if it's for the rest of the world, not for the Chinese. Well, they see the potential danger of my activism uh, online because at that time, for a moment, I was quite, uh, quite vivid, you know, I raised uh, a, a strong voice. But that's why they have to um, put this kind of punishment on me. But I, I wonder, you say in your book, uh, young people in China today have no knowledge at all of the student protests in Tiananmen Square in 1989. And if they knew, they might not even care for they learn submission before they develop an ability to raise doubts and challenge assumptions. I think so. You know, they're kind of like a bird has been in cage for too long. They cannot challenge to, to fly. What will China listen to? Do you think a cultural boycott would work, for instance? I don't think so. I don't think anything uh, the West uh, doing this kind of boycott would work uh, because they simply, China can suffer. Uh, you know, the, the, the government is not going to suffer, but the people really uh, understand what uh, is uh, like when they don't have that much. So, 
in that kind of competition, China can go very low, and I don't think the West can compete with China. I was thinking about the cultural boycott because, of course, um, you know, museums and galleries still collaborate heavily in China. And yet, actually, in the sports world, we've seen uh, anti-China messages on certain sports uh, people's <laughs> shoes. Serena Williams has come out, for instance, recently for Peng Shui, the Chinese tennis superstar who made allegations online that she was sexually assaulted by a Chinese official. Uh, those allegations very quickly deleted. We should say she was also having an affair with that individual. Um, I, I just wonder, do you think any of those actions are, are with merit? I think those actions are really helping the Western public to understand China. But uh, for Chinese, uh, they, they know this is not going to work because uh, the big corporations in the West, they're eager to make a bigger profit in China. Nobody in the West, uh, corp in the corporate world, will boycott China. So just a few sportsmen or artists certainly will not work. I mentioned the tennis player Peng Shui talking about what happened to her. How brave do you have to be to do what she did? What she did is nothing to do with the brave. Go on. You know, I think it's also misinterpretation. She is a sport person, which is like a soldier in the army. It's raised by the Chinese state. Any person in sport uh, being considered as a property of the party. So what she did, I don't think it's uh, that brave. She feels she has been mistreated, and she posts on her own personal blog or being deleted. Then later she performs uh, according to the you know the state's will, you know, to let her perform, she's fine. And what is more disgusting is the the tennis association and the Olympics jury or Olympics committee trying to cover up. They are they're not really make a, a, a demanding to have the truth out. I mean, you may not agree that it's brave. You see, you explain the reason why you think she did it. I suppose it's just you talked about what can happen to you in China, and there is concern about what will happen to her now. Oh yes, she's in a horrible situation uh, because she made this. Uh, you know, I don't know. Uh, you know, she is she is a regret or not? But she seems now only performs uh, on the same line as the state and of course being forced. So it's business? That's the only hope? Bus business is dominating in every corner of the world. Why do you think even cultural boycotts haven't caught on in the West of China? We see them of Israel, for instance, but we don't see the same levels of outrage a lot of the time over the imprisonment of Uyghur Muslims, for instance, who you mentioned earlier. Well. I don't know. Uh, have you seen any successful bo of a cultural boycott which can shake a, a society like China? You know, it's not possible. And uh, with many, many uh, regions, boy, uh, cultural boycott just simply doesn't work. China has been isolated and locked up for years before, and uh, they survived. Are you resigned to China staying like this then? Or are you still, do you still have fight in you, Weiwei? I do fight all the time because the fight is nature of my life. It's not because I want to win. It's only because I have to fight. That's, that's, I have no other choice. Who are you fighting for now? If we've established that those in China don't know you and can't see you, and it's now you have to live away from your mom and you have to live in Portugal, how effective can you be, do you think? I'm fighting for a lot of people who, who is uh, in the same condition as me. We have been forced out from our land. You know, we, we, we cannot have a normal communication with our family. And, uh, you know, because of all kinds of reasons. So we have to find a way to express ourselves and uh, to let our voice to be heard. It was just I was thinking uh, of the, the Russian Putin critic Alexei Navalny, who went back 
in Russia, now in jail. Do, do you ever feel, have you ever thought about going back because you can make that kind of impact? Uh, my life is not just making impact. My life is about uh, how to successfully express myself. So I could go back, you know, it's not uh, I'm uh, scared or afraid of anything, but I also have a responsibility. I do have family and also have to care about what my mom think about. Do you think you'll ever see your mom again? Mm, I see her online, but uh, I, of, of course, I always want to go back, so. Well, how do you live with that on a personal level? That must be very difficult. Not very difficult. It's just uh, the idea of I cannot go back is difficult to accept. But uh, the other thing is pretty normal. Many people uh, has been separated from their parents. If you look at the refugees, you know, in the world, and uh, there's millions and millions of people, they can, they are separated. You talked about your, your role being to be able to express yourself. Your art is political. Uh, sometimes deliberately uh, vulgar, some would say, or offensive. Do you think you've ever taken it too far? No, far from being too far. I've been too soft. And my voice is very low. And, uh, yeah. In what way? Why have you been too soft? Because the world is just uh, being indifferent. If we say the whole world basically is a hypocrisy, you know, people don't care. They pretend they care, but they don't care at all. And, uh, you know, my voice is, doesn't matter. I was thinking then about the fact that you brought up refugees and when you recreated the image that had gone around the world of a three-year-old Syrian refugee boy, Alan Kurdi, who'd washed up dead on a Greek beach, it was an incredibly upsetting image. You then posed yourself as him and some people did feel that was utterly tasteless, even if you were raising the plight of refugees. I think I post that image purposely to make those people think that's uh, tasteless, uh, uh, make them feel bad because those people are really hypocritic uh, crowd. They don't know how many children have been drowned in that uh, uh, sea, in that ocean. His brother just uh, uh, a few meters away from him, people doesn't even care. You know, the whole world is just so much, uh, uh, so fake and so pretending, and the refugee situation is and then become even worse. Nobody even asks the questions anymore. So you did that because you wanted to point out people's hypocrisy to them, but people may, that photo did have a real image. People felt it was enough as it was. It didn't need you to pose. I, what did you I actually, don't care. What, what did you create by doing that? I don't care what those people think about. I don't care about, you know, whatever they think about. And uh, I think, uh, I don't even know they are there. I don't know if they are human at all. If they understand what happens to the, this world, what happens to those refugees, the only thing you left is angry. You know, you see the world pretending nothing's happening, but that would lead to an even bigger disaster. So that sort of criticism doesn't even enter your mind? It doesn't bother you at no, all? No, that makes me joy, uh, happy, you know, I feel I touched those uh, very fake people and uh, they are shaking somehow. So cancel culture, this idea, this new form of Western censorship, you talk about politically correct extremism. Uh, that none of this sort of gets to you. I think it's horrible. Uh, and besides China, you know, you can see what happens in the West. Basically, it's a totally fake and uh, hypocrisy dominates the world and the culture. In what way? You can see they are so unrealistic when they start yes. discussion uh, about the world politics. You see this Turkish journalist being killed in, uh, you know, the journalist being killed in Turkish embassy. Actually, he's a Saudi or American Turkey, uh, journalist, but Americans still doing business with Turkey, uh, with uh, Saudi. And uh, Trump said clearly they will not stop uh, to do the business with Saudi. Is that 
yeah, clear no, enough. I, I, the I whole Western world, the whole Western world, start selling because they want a business. Is that enough to say what is the, is the real human rights record? And the hypocrisy that you're talking about. So I'm interested to go back to. No, no, no. There, you have, there's millions of these kind of stories. You, for, as British, pulled out Julian Assange from the embassy. Now he still ended up in the British prison. Is that hypocrisy? Julian provide the, you know, the so-called uh, WikiLeaks, which exposed the criminal act by governments. And that is a foundation of investigate journalism. Sorry, but he also didn't go back to a country where there were allegations of sexual assault. Those allegations no, of that's, those, that's, if you, could you let me that's, finish? That Sorry, is wait, wait, wrong. I have listened to you. That is could wrong. Let, that is could wrong. Could you let me finish? They, those, no, I think those you made a charges. wrong accusation. You make a very no, wrong no, accusation. You, the Sweden the already was charged. They already withdraw the charge. Why you repeat to saying that? That is no, no. Fake. They didn't withdraw the charge. The charge expired. There is a huge difference, and I'm a keen, keen. You will appreciate as a journalist and as someone who doesn't like why, censorship. Why I will don't let him to to go back to Sweden? Then he has to go back to U.S. Let him go back to Sweden to face the charge. Sorry. You say that I made an error. I did not. For the record, I think those you charges made an error. had expired. The facts are the facts, Wei Wei. No, I don't think that's a fact. Using a, a fact which is not working. I'm using a fact that isn't working. OK. What would you create if you could? You said that you haven't done all that you wanted. Your voice has been too low. What is the piece of art or the political act or the installation that you would have create that you perhaps haven't done? Oh, there's too many. I have done very little. I should be humbly say I haven't started yet. I was interested that you said before that art is a sign of social health. And I wonder what you think of the way that it's now being traded as an asset. I don't know. I cannot uh, really describe the other people's behaving. Well, I think I was also thinking of uh, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, these unique digital assets, a new big thing in art. I wonder what you make of them. I don't think uh, that's new big thing in the art. I mean, that's new big thing in financial world or in technical world. I have no idea, but nothing big in art. As part of the market, I suppose, do you think they're, they're a fad or do you think they're brilliant? Do you own any? No, no, I, I, uh, I'm not interested in, in it, but I may, if I find the right topic or right moment, can carry right message. Why not? But uh, I, I still cannot associate with it. The last time we met in person, I actually wanted a photo of us. And you were very funny because you insisted on taking it on my phone as a selfie so I could have an Ai Weiwei. Yes, you would have an original work. <laughs> so who owns that, me or you? Of course, uh, it's done by me. You own it because it's your property. OK, I just wanted to clarify that. It, it was a very good picture. But you also said to me that you were done with art. You were getting frustrated and perhaps you would be happy just doing something simple. You said to me you'd be happy sitting on a bench. Yeah, today in the interview they said I cannot sit in a chair. They want uh, you know, the background to be more clean, so I'm sitting on a stool. You are sitting on a comfortable chair. Do you know what, though? I'd much rather we were together sitting outside. It would be lovely. That would be nice. Thank you very much for talking to me again. Thank you. Thank you so much for being with us. Until we meet again, mask up, stay safe, and goodbye.